Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Haytham and I've been a software engineer for the last five, six years. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, deep learning. It's just a quick introduction with the goal of maybe uh, you're interested to know what this is about and you're interested to maybe try it out, see what's all the fuzz about. Yeah, so let's dive into the index. So just a minute introduction about who we are, Fairbox, the company that I'm working with. Uh, then we will move quickly to a quick introduction about what's AI, artificial intelligence, what's deep learning, and how are they connected. And we'll, we will discuss briefly the difference between how humans learn and how machine learns. Yeah, and we'll also go quickly through the deep learning uh, process. So how does deep learning work? Um, in the next, uh, let's say, section, we will talk about popular deep learning frameworks. So this will not only be an introduction on what is deep learning, but we'll also take a look at the uh, ecosystem around it. So what frameworks do we have? Uh, what are the deep learning networks that we will also take a look at uh, qu with a quick introduction? And yeah, so also popular cloud providers where you can start your system and actually start with the first deep learning uh, application. And yeah, to give you an example of all of that, we'll, we will also or I will also present our experiment. We had a little experiment in Viabox, and yeah, we wanted to show you what we did, what we went through, and what, are, what kind of results did we come up with. So in this uh, experiment, we will be going through uh, frameworks, also networks, providers, why did we choose whatever we choose of these options. And for the conclusion, it's going to be some kind of uh, tips on which, what should you do or what sh questions should you ask and answer before you start with your first deep learning uh, application. So if you have, you have clear answers for these questions, then you're on a good way to actually start your own uh, deep learning app. So let's get started. So Fearbox, we're a, we're a company founded in 2009. We're located in Koenigswinter. And we're currently 13 employees and looking forward to increase that number. So if you're interested, we're hiring. And yeah, so we're very active in the developer meetups in Bonn and Cologne. And recently, we're ISO 9001 certified, which is a big deal for a software company. And yeah, we, we've uh, recently got the award of uh, Innovative Through Research. Yeah, so uh, as you can see, we're very interested in research. We are always uh, looking out for research projects. So what is deep learning? So deep learning is a subset of a subset of artificial intelligence. So for artificial intelligence, uh, it's just a way for uh, machines to mimic human behaviors. That's the whole idea. And machine learning is a subset of that, where it uses statistical methods to actually improve the, uh, the machine's experience. So to get it closer to how humans, let's say, interact. Uh, this, was, this is where deep learning comes, which is also a subset from machine learning. And the, whole, or the big idea is it's making uh, deeper layers of training or of uh, uh, multi-layer neural networks feasible. So before, it wasn't feasible to go deeper in the neural networks, which we will explain a little bit later, be because we didn't have the computer powers, let's say. That brings us to the challenges that we had before that we overcome now. And that's why we have deep learning, which are uh, the availability of data. So before, you didn't have much data. Now data is all, all around you. And we also didn't have much computer power. So for deep learning, you're doing a lot of parallelization. And CPUs are kind of slow in parallelization compared to GPUs, which if you want to do deep learning correctly, 
you're going to do it on a GPU machine because it's much, much faster. And yeah, these are some of the uh, challenges. One more challenge is frameworks. So before, if you wanted to do some kind of deep learning, you're going to be writing everything on your own. So you're going to be writing the algorithms, you're going to be writing the filters and the layers and the architecture and everything, and how to import data, how to visualize it, everything. So that's, that's really complex to do on your own. But fortunately, now we have a lot of frameworks, which we will cover in, in a couple of uh, slides later. So that's deep learning, or introduction. And now let's compare how humans learn or how machine is supposed to learn. So let's take dogs, for example. So for humor, ever since you're a kid, you see a lot of dogs, a lot of shapes, sizes, and colors. And in your mind, you, you come up with a visualization that this is how a dog should look like. So when you see a new dog that you've never seen before, you have this visualization, and you kind of know that this thing is a dog or a cat or something. And an effort to kind of uh, do the same in machines, that's how uh, a machine would learn, is you have different layers of filters. And these filters are just doing one specific task. For example, filter A is detecting vertical, vertical lines in an image. Another filter is detecting, let's say, edges or round objects or even uh, different in contra contracts. So <clears throat> all these filters combined will actually formulate a, a model that represents something. Uh, in this case, it's representing faces, but it can also represent a dog or a cat or whatever object you're trying to learn and model. Yeah, so, and to, uh, to enable the uh, machine to do this, you have to go through a couple of, uh, let's say, um, phases. These phases are the training and inference. So this is your deep learning application. This is what it's supposed to do. First, you have to train it, which is collect a lot of data, not just any data. You have to prepare it also. For example, let's take cats versus dogs. You have to have multiple pictures of cats, multiple pictures of dogs, and you have to have them labeled that these are dogs and these are cats. And you have to do some pre-processing before you start consuming this data. So resize it to a specific size, uh, maybe flatten it, the image, so it's not a two-dimensional array, let's say. It's one flat image or one flat array that will make it easier to work with for the machine. Yeah, then you can actually start your training process. The, uh, the framework or the engine will consume all this data and try to apply these filters and layers and come up with the model, which is your target here. You want a model that represents cats or dogs, and it's able to come up or identify the difference between them. So this model is usually saved as a file, and it can be used in the next operation, which is inference. <clears throat> so for inference, you're actually loading this model that you just created, and you're uh, now ready to classify new images of cats and dogs. You just send a request to this model, and you ask it, is this picture of a cat, or is this picture of a dog? And it will be able to tell the difference with uh, with, within an accuracy, element of accuracy. So uh, it's really hard to find something that's 100% accurate, but the more data you have, the, the better or the closer you are to this 100%. But you're probably never going to get there because nothing is that accurate, let's say. Yeah, so to do this, these two processes, you don't have to write everything on your own. As we said, you have frameworks. And these frameworks um, are getting, uh, let's say, uh, more popular. And these frameworks are its just any library or tool that enables you to start a, a deep learning application without diving into the algorithms and the 
really small details that you don't really want to care about. So, and um, yeah, these are some of the uh, frameworks that are out there, and they're right by Statista, which on a, based on a power ranking, as we can see, TensorFlow is the really the most popular or powerful one. So just a background on why or how did they rank them. Uh, they're looking at Google search, ser Google searches, uh, GitHub activity, uh, and uh, yeah, many other yeah, articles, books, anything, publications around these frameworks, and they're basing the score on that. As we can see, TensorFlow and Keras are really the top two, and TensorFlow is way ahead of the others. Um, now we will be talking a little bit about advantages, disadvantages of the first four uh, frameworks. Uh, up until now, any questions? Yeah, please. Test. Uh, yeah, my question is, uh, it says uh, power ranking, mm -hmm. uh, but what does that mean? It's like the, 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 the ability of the frameworks or like the, the capabilities or what, what does it power mean in, 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 in that yeah. regard? So uh, the power is not, re uh, not directly related to the capabilities of the framework or let's say the performance, but on the popularity that uh, let's say, as we said, from um, how many people are using it, on how popular is it, and how uh, easy is it to uh, to find, let's say, documentation for this thing. So that's why TensorFlow is really on the top. As we can see, uh, this is a good point to switch to the next slide. Why is uh, uh, sorry? Why is TensorFlow is so predominant? So uh, just a little background. Uh, TensorFlow was developed by Google Brain Team, and it was intended to be only for internal use. They, at the first, they didn't pl plan on open sourcing it, but they did. And ever since, it's the most popular uh, framework and has really good documentation, both at the official and community support. And it has this really powerful tool, TensorBoard, which will help you visualizing, uh, debugging, or even getting get in more details on the deep learning process. So it's not just that it's good, it's also well documented, and it's really being developed and worked on. And yeah, uh, one also big advantage is you can use it using Python, C++, R, and usually the applications are text-based or image-based recognition classification. Um, yeah, as you can see, also sound, sound recognition and time series analysis, video analysis, all these uh, applications, let's say. And it has this one disadvantage, which is a steep learning curve. So if you're starting with uh, TensorFlow, you're going to face some challenges at the first steps to actually be, be proficient in it. So. This is one point to consider if you're choosing to start to work with this. And this, uh, this problem was solved by Keras, which is developed by a guy that used to work in Google, and he thought TensorFlow is a little bit too low level, let's say, too complex, so he came up with Keras, which is a high level library. It makes your life much, much easier, and you can just start and just by reading the lines, you know what they're kind of doing. And yeah, so it's not an independent by itself. It can work on top of uh, TensorFlow and Tiano and CNTK, which is from uh, Microsoft, Microsoft Cognitive Tools. Um, yeah, so you have some options, but if, you, if we look down here, it has support only for Python, so you're limited to using Python. If you don't know Python, you're going to have to learn Python a little bit. Yeah, and it supports sequential and functional styles, so depends on your uh, type of programming. And 
as it's a high-level library, you kind of have less control for these details. For example, you can still use TensorBoard to view your learning process, but you cannot, in the code, uh, be as more specific in details as you can with TensorFlow, for example. Uh, so yeah, these are the two most prominent uh, deep learning frameworks so far. But we have a very good contender here, which is PyTorch. PyTorch is really picking up now, lately for the last year or so. And it's developed by the research group in Facebook. And yeah. Yeah, so and uh, yeah, so it's easy to use, much easier to use, let's say, than TensorFlow because it's Pythonic in nature. So if you know Python, you can easily just program. And it's uh, really good in training and classification. It's a little bit faster than TensorFlow for to be to do a comparison. Yeah, and mostly the applications are image detection and classification, natural language processing, and reinform, reinform, reinforcement learning. Yeah. Uh, going back also to the uh, disadvantages, only Python, and and it's not as mature as TensorFlow or Keras, so it's only produced or released for production in December last year. So people are not really comfortable to go with it to production level applications just yet. And now the fourth one from top was CAFE. Uh, CAFE was developed first as a research project in the University of California, Berkeley. And it's written in C, that's why it's really quick with working with images, as we, can, uh, as we will tell. And the interesting about, uh, thing about CAFE is that Yahoo kind of uh, took CAFE and integrated it with Spark and to create CAFE on Spark, which is distributed deep learning, uh, let's say platform our framework, and also Facebook developed Cafe2, they took Cafe, developed Cafe2, and then integrated it into PyTorch, which we saw in the previous example. Um, yeah, and big advantages are speed of image processing uh, during the learning uh, process, which is consuming the data, and during the inference when you're trying to classify dogs versus cats, for example. And you can use it with many different languages, C, C++, Python, MATLAB. So you have more options there. Uh, currently, it's mostly used by, for academic research, but it also some have, have some large-scale applications, vision, speech, speech and multimedia. Um, coming down to the limitations, so we don't have support for recurrent neural networks which are special, uh, or a special part of neural networks where kind of the training, the, the, uh, let's say the layers are connected in a way that can represent a loop. And yeah, it's a little bit harder to get started with to learn than, uh, let's say, the Python-based uh, frameworks or, the, yeah. Uh, for now, any questions? All right. Yeah. No. No. Just a remark. As far as I know, Keras is also available in R. Okay. I'll take a look into that. Yeah. Uh, so the remark was uh, that Keras is also available in R. So we, I need to do a little bit more research on that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, one, one small note also that uh, Keras will be integrated in the new version of TensorFlow. So they're currently working on TensorFlow 2.0, which will have Keras built in inside. So uh, yeah, that's a good step you having. Instead of using two frameworks together, you're only using TensorFlow and it has these capabilities. Yeah, so we've been talking about Neural networks are, what are they, are why, why are they named like this? So a neural network is something or a bunch of algorithms that are 
loosely uh, modeled after the human brain. So we can see kind of the connection where we have these neurons or nodes and they're interconnected with each other. That's where the uh, name came up. It's, uh, it's not because of a functionality on how they, or how they work, but it's loosely on how they look like. And the, um, yeah, the, the, let's say the purpose of these layers is to detect patterns. So you detect smaller patterns and combine, combine all these patterns together, let's say, and you end up with a model for something bigger, cat or dog or bicycle or a desk or anything. Yeah, and uh, now we'll take a look at a couple of the, the uh, most popular deep learning networks. Um, the first one, which was deep, let's say it was only eight layers deep, it was called the AlexNet, and it was a revolution because no one ever before built uh, a, a neural network that is eight layers deep. That was in 2012, and it won a contest by a really large margin over the other competitors. So it's a classification uh, contest that's happening yearly, and they just took the first place, and now the world kind of realized that if you have more layers, then you have more, uh, more accuracy, you have better results. Um, yeah. Uh, next, uh, next uh, let's say, network that we want to talk about is the residual networks. ResNet, it has multiple or multiple versions, but the idea of this network is we have this uh, loop or this uh, skipping part where a layer is skipping a layer. So you have a connection skipping a layer, and that's done to uh, have more data in the next layers. So uh, just a, a quick or for each layer, when you're doing the uh, pattern recognition, you're using uh, you're losing a little bit of data from the the original image. So, so if you start with a really large image, about five layers, let's say later, you have a, a subset of the image, a much dense image, and it's, it's lost some data. So with this technique, you can have more, uh, more width, more length in the image, or more data, and then you can actually stack up more layers. So instead of eight, we have now 50 or even more. And yeah, so uh, ResNets uh, enabled us to go much, much deeper. And that take, takes us to Google Nets, which are the inception nets. So now we have the first technique, which is skipping a layer. And now Google came up with the Google, with the Google Net or inception, which has also many versions. Uh, instead of having one, let's say, filter per layer, one filter with size, let's say, three by three, you can have two or three or even four filters. As we can see, the layers, or the, uh, the layers are getting uh, wider, not, not only deeper. So with these techniques combined, we're now able to go to hundreds of layers deep, which was really unprecedented five years from when this came out, for example. Yeah, and they kept working on this. We have now Inception version 3, which came out 2015. It's also really big, really uh, a really deep network, and they started testing with combinations, for example, Inception with ResNet, and came out with Inception ResNet, for example. And yeah, you can just Google search a little bit more on what other networks are there. Uh, each network kind of have its uh, weak points or uh, strong points, and you can just read about each one to know which applications are more useful for this, uh, which, which, let's say, deep uh, CNN is more useful for my application. Uh, yeah. So, uh, let's say, for example, you know which network you want to use, you know which framework you want to use, but now is the question is, do I use my machine to set up everything, or do I need a cloud server or cloud service to have this, uh, to have my application on? The answer is you can have both. You can 
uh, set up your machine to do the processing, to do the, all the uh, two steps, let's say the inference and the training. But you can also uh, just go on the cloud and it might make more sense for the, uh, let's say, for the coming reasons. So one of these uh, providers is Google Cloud. And there you can easily set up machines, but just by clicking next, 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 selecting a couple of stuff, then you have a machine that has, let's say, TensorFlow 1.13, and it's pretty much configured and ready to use. So you don't have to do any kind of setup. Uh, as, we can, as we will see that many of uh, cloud providers already have these kind of machines that are ready to be used. Uh, the good thing also about Google is you get a 12-month, $300 trial. So you can use it for deep learning or other stuff also. Um, next provider is Amazon Web Services, of course. Uh, yeah, they also have a lot of uh, AMIs, which are Amazon Machine Images. They are open to VMs, also pre-configured with any choice of uh, frameworks that you want. And yeah, you also get a free trial for 12 months, but it's very limited, and you probably cannot get a really high-end GPU machine to do your uh, to do your uh, work or application. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of other big names uh, that you can go with, but also keep an eye on the smaller providers, for example, Paperspace. So when we did our experiment that we will talk about in a bit, um, we actually went with Paperspace. Uh, our first choice was, was Amazon, but it was really difficult to get a machine from Amazon, even the paid one. Uh, they were really booked, and there was no way to get to provision a new machine. So we started to look somewhere else, and we found Paperspace. Um, they have also the machine learning in a box VMs, so pre-configured, pre-installed. You have a GPU machine, a real GPU, not just, let's say, a share of virtual GPU, let's say. And yeah, you can have the pricing model that you want, and we found out that they have really excellent customer support uh, uh, services. And yeah, that's why these were the three reasons that we went with Paperspace, let's say, instead of Google or with, uh, with uh, Amazon. Yeah, so also worth noting that there are probably a lot more. Microsoft, Flo Floyd Hub, Google Colab, uh, GPU Eater, even Alibaba has now these kind of machines that will uh, you can do deep learning on. Um, yeah. So uh, depends on your needs. For example, uh, with the data protection laws, you cannot have data in, from the uh, European Union saved somewhere else. So that might limit your choices of which providers do you want to go with. So just keep these things in mind, and you will be or you'll find some options to, for cloud for providers. Um, before we jump to our next, cloud, uh, next uh, slide, which is about our personal or our experience in Fearbox, any more questions, comments? Uh, no, I don't see. OK. So uh, at Fearbox, uh, so at first we wanted to get uh, uh, let's say, to work with via, with the deep learning. And we figured, OK, uh, we need a goal. We need uh, to choose where do we do our stuff. We need to choose which uh, providers we're going to use, which uh, frameworks. And our setup was as follows. So the task was we want to classify or write an app that classifies cats and dogs. So you. You want, it to, you want it at the end to be able to uh, separate or classify a cat or a dog. And we went with Paperspace for reasons we mentioned before. And uh, we used uh, Kaggle. Kaggle is kind of a platform where you have a lot of data, a lot of competitions. It's really getting popular, popular lately. And yeah, it's, um, if you want to start with deep learning, you're going to hear about Kaggle a lot. 
There's, uh, they do annual or more than annual competitions, let's say, with uh, actually financial re uh, rewards. For example, the cats versus dogs data set came from a competition that uh, you can enter, subscribe, and do your, uh, let's say, app, and you compete with other people to, uh, let's say, in a specific task, and the winner gets this, this much, these rewards. Yeah, so we got our data from there, and we decided to go with Keras with TensorFlow because it's the easiest combination. You have the powerful uh, TensorFlow back backend with Keras as a uh, let's say as a library to work with, which is much much easier. And we didn't need to go into details to change the smaller details of uh, the deep learning process. So Keras was enough, and it was actually. Uh, quicker for development. And um, as a part of the experiment, we wanted to compare the, um, the performance of uh, multiple uh, CNNs or convolutional neural networks. So we have dense nets and we have inception that we saw before. We have the ResNet also. We have the inception ResNet V2. And we have a couple of mobile nets, which are really smaller nets that are designed to be quick, efficient, and they can actually uh, eventually run on anything. They're that compact and that uh, slow, uh, that uh, small. Um, yeah, and we had uh, we kept our eye on a couple of metrics, accuracy. So for each uh, network after you train, there's a validation or validation step inside the training. And it will, uh, uh, yeah, tell you how accurate your training is. Yeah. Yeah. So, are there a set for these names? Are there a set of parameters, or are they just names? Uh, so, for denseness, for example, it's uh, the one-to-one -one is the number of layers. One six nine is a bigger network, and 201 is 201 layers uh, deep network. Uh, for, this, uh, for the uh, inception, for example, it's just the uh, version of that. Uh, yeah, mobile net is also the same, the version of the network that they came off with. So uh, developers will, uh, will develop this network with, the, with this kind of architecture, with this many layers here, that many layers there. And they kind of give it names based on the architecture itself, and let's say version one, version two, this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to the metrics, uh, so we have accuracy, which is how accurate your predictions are. For example, if you predict 100 images of cats and you only predict correctly 90 of them, then you're at 0.9 percent. Uh, loss is. Uh, Loss is a tricky thing, so it's, it's a number that you want to go to zero. If you have a higher loss, it's, that means your network is not, not behaving correctly and you need to change some stuff. So uh, the difference between uh, the, uh, the reality and the expectation is too high. Uh, uh, yeah, and for the training speed, so usually uh, the training process takes a lot of time and especially if you're doing it on your local machine, which doesn't have a GPU, one, one of these could take up to two, three hours to train on only 2,000 images or so, if you want to go for maybe five epochs, which we will talk about maybe later. So the training process is relevant because you want to train quickly, you want to be able to adapt to changes in your data set really quickly, so training speed, is relevant here. And we also have the inference speed, where uh, if I give this model or this network an image, how fast will I get a, an answer? So we kept our eye on these kind of uh, metrics. And uh, questions again? Yeah. So, yeah.
Yeah. So the question was, uh, for your problem, which, how do you decide which network to go with? That's an excellent question. Thank you. So usually, uh, each, as we said, each one has its own, let's say, uh, its own field that it excels in, but all of them, for example, can do cats versus dogs. And this, is, was, this was part of our experiment. Let's say which one, let's see which one is better as in the binary classification, for example, task. Uh, but you can also uh, just, uh, depending on your, your use case, you have to search around, see what's, uh, what's the best uh, network there, and it comes with a little bit of experience. Maybe actually none of them is 100% fitting your architecture or your purpose, and you need to actually go into these networks and ch tweak a little bit, change a little bit of details. That can be done, for example, using Keras, where you can go to specific layers out of these 201 layers and just do changes here and there. So as you get more experienced, you will get to uh, know which, which network is uh, suitable for this task or not. But for image classifications, uh, most of these or all of these are good enough, let's say, as we will see in the next slide. More questions? Yeah. So um, we did our experiment, we set up our machine, we uh, uh, pushed the data in, we trained each network for 10 epochs, which is 10 rounds of training on the data set. And um, yeah, we came up with these results. Uh, it might not be uh, that much clear, but the goal or the, um, the result of this, so we're looking at the validation accuracy, how accurate these networks are in uh, deciding if this is a cat or this is a dog. As we can see in the beginning, there's a, well, there was a big difference. Uh, the lowest two curves that you see are for the mobile nets, which are not really deep, so you have less information there, less, uh, less of a model to, uh, to, uh, to do the uh, classification. And you can see that the deeper networks, like DenseNet uh, 201, 169, 121, or even the Inception, Inception ResNet, yeah, these are the most uh, or the largest networks, and they ended up with the highest validation accuracy. Um, so that's a suggestion that the deeper the network, it usually means that you're going to get more accurate results. Um, yeah, but so um, we don't have a slide for this, but uh, talking about loss, because we wanted to keep an eye on that. Uh, these also deeper networks have lesser loss. So the dense nets all had the same loss, which is, was a really small number, and all the other bigger networks kind of had also smaller loss. And uh, looking at the mobile nets, which are really small, they had higher loss than the rest. And now we can look at the relation between the depth and the uh, training duration. So we ran for 10 epochs, and so 10, 10 times the training on the same, or on the data. And as you can see, DenseNet took about 700 something uh, seconds, that's in seconds. So I uh, forgot how much that in minutes, 12 minutes to run 10 epochs, which is not bad because you're pushing so much data and you're getting 90 something, 97 percent accuracy results. And the, uh, you can see the trend here is the deeper network it is, it's going to be take so much time to train. And this is also representative of the uh, classification time. So also the deeper the network, the more time it's going to need to classify. And yeah, so this training was done on a GPU, I think it was um, K8000 from NVIDIA. So it's a really powerful machine, and it, was, it needed 12 minutes, for example, for the uh, DenseNet 201. If you want to do the same training on this Mac, let's say, it might take up to four hours or something to do the same 
or maybe more, I think even maybe more, just to, to do the same set. So this gives you an idea of how much GPUs are better than CPUs in doing the training, which you always need to keep in mind. Do I really need the uh, training to be that quick, or am I okay with waiting a little bit for uh, reducing the cost, let's say, of the GPU, but also I have to wait a little bit more. So these are uh, comparisons that you have to do. Yeah, so giving these results, we kind of came up with some conclusions. Uh, we like the DenseNet uh, the most because it had a really high accuracy, really low loss, and yeah, it didn't take that much time to train compared to the other, the other uh, bigger two networks, and it had the same accuracy, the same loss, and yeah, uh, but it was a little bit slow in the classification time. So when you send an image, is this a cat or is this a dog? It's taking a little bit more time to get the reply back. For example, if you compare it with the mobile nets, which are really quick in reply, but they're not that accurate. So again, you have to do the comparison here. Um, looking at Inception, which is one of kind of the older ones, uh, it's really quick in classification time because it's not that deep, but the accuracy was not impressive. So, yeah, even though this makes more uh, sense from the, uh, let's say, the classification time perspective, but accuracy is not good enough to actually consider it. Um, yeah, so that was our experience uh, so far. Um, yeah, any questions here about the results? Yeah, please. Yeah. So how much time does a classification usually take? Uh, the answer is in milliseconds. So uh, usually, I think the, uh, the longest classification time was around 45 milliseconds. And it also depends on which machine are you running this classification on. So there might be a 10 times slower to run the classification on this Mac, for example, than a um, uh, cloud machine, which is really powerful. So it depends on your setup, and it depends on how deep the uh, network is. Uh, yeah, if your classification is taking, let's say, one second, that's not a good thing. You probably need to improve on um, maybe choose a, le a smaller network, or maybe if that's fine by you, one second is OK. But in real life applications, you want to go to milliseconds uh, uh, perspective, let's say. More questions? Yeah. Uh, again, sorry? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so after the training part is done, uh, the same uh, model that you came up with is not increasing because you're not training it again. So you can have, uh, let's say, two separate processes where uh, the training is happening live and you always have newer, the more data, or when you put more data, it will produce a new model, but usually the two operations uh, are separate, but you can have... Uh, uh, a network that's live that is taking data and classifying and at the same time it's uh, also training on this new set of data. But usually it makes sense to separate these two because the training is taking so much CPU power and maybe you're running the classification app on a smaller device or a smaller, uh, maybe a mobile or a uh, set like this. So, yeah. Uh, more questions? Yeah. In the training, it looked like that some uh, neural networks are learning, like, for the first epoch, they are, like, over 95%, mm -hmm. right, 89. 
would it be possible to just do two epochs of training because it's much yeah. less training time and so we use a deeper neural network and its advantages in the form of less training time because of less yeah. epochs? Yeah, that's uh, a valid question too. So um, if you remember our slide, uh, the first two or three epochs is where you see significant, uh, let's say, improvements. But then it, most of them, or all of them, kind of flat out to this plateau, let's say. And yeah, it makes sense. So now you know that if I train to 20 epochs, it's not going to make more difference than training for five. So why should I go for 20? Which is a valid question, and that's a good point. That's something you should do. So am I, am I good enough with five? If the answer is yes, then you stop at five, because you don't see more improvements going on there. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, training the data with the, training the network with the same data multiple times. Uh, so you can have uh, something in the pre-processing, uh, preparing the data phase, where you don't just take the image at you. Uh, images as they are, because that might not be very useful. You kind of do some image manipulations where you rotate in a, in a random amount, and you kind of uh, horizont, uh, so it's a vert uh, rotating and kind of changing the perspective. It's maybe blurring a little bit, it's maybe cutting some edges. So each time you'll have more data. So you have the basic data set the same, but from the preparation of data process, you'll have more data. You'll have uh, more or less changed data. That's why from a smaller set of data, you can actually get really good results, or relatively small. When I say relatively small, 2,000 is barely enough. But if you have 2 million, let's say, images, then you're getting uh, better and better results. Uh, more questions? Yeah, please. Okay. Okay. So the question is, where do you get your data set from, and how you how do you decide that these are good images or or not? Uh, so usually, uh, what we did and what we recommend is looking at Kaggle, which is the f platform that we talked about. It has a lot of data on a lot of different stuff, and um, yeah, you can choose your data set from there. There's always a description of what is this data set representing? What's, for example, if it was images, what are the uh, images sizes? Uh, let's say average sizes. Uh, are they colored images, non-colored? Are they, let's say, recent or not recent? So you'll get a lot of details there. Or you can do go the hard way, which is collecting the data yourself. You can run around in the neighborhood taking pictures of dogs and cats, but probably you don't really need to do that. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's, it's going to be your decision to see if this is, is this data representative of the, uh, the process or the goal that I want to, to do. Yeah, please. Did you compare your results to the Kaggle results? So because they provide the solution, right? They have this... Uh... Uh, correct. And I don't think so. It wasn't part, it wasn't in our interest to, let's say, compete or to uh, compare with this. We just wanted to do our own uh, experiment and see which of these networks are the best in this case. But yeah, that's a good point. I'm now interested to go back and look how, what, for example, the winner uh, of that uh, competition, how much accuracy, loss, and these values that they have. More questions? Yeah. Uh, how much time did it to set up uh, all of your tests? Okay. Yeah, so the question is, uh, how much time and how much difficult is it to set up the whole thing? Uh, so code-wise, uh, let's say it depends on how efficient are you with coding, but with Keras, you're probably going to find a lot of examples or a lot of, uh, um, yeah, a lot of uh, 
material that will help you build up your application quickly. And regarding the setup with the environment that we did the trainings on, so as we said, uh, PowerSpace has uh, machines that are already configured, so you don't really need to set up the frameworks and the GPU libraries or the uh, drivers and this kind of stuff. You don't have to do this. Uh, but unfortunately, we kind of wasted or we had to do some changes there because we wanted to update the uh, NVIDIA drivers, CUDA drivers, I think they're called. And there was a little bit of incompatibility with uh, these newer drivers versus the, uh, the machine or the GPU itself. So that took some time. But usually, if you just want to run something uh, and you have the code ready, it doesn't take you more than one minute to actually just run this Python code, and it's, it starts uh, doing the, uh, the training, for example. But uh, un unknown circumstances can a little bit prolong this. So I don't think we took more than one, two working days to get through all these, figure out the problems first, and then set up the environment the way we want it. More questions? What's the difference between accuracy and loss? Okay, the question is difference between accuracy and loss. Uh, so, uh, accuracy is just looking at how many pictures did you guess, 100 pictures, how many did you guess correctly? The answer is, let's say, 90. Then you have a 9, 9.9 uh, accuracy. Loss looks at uh, for each image, uh, you have a Let's say this is a 90% uh, cat. That's what my network kind of figures out. Then you have this 10%, and you have this 15% from the other image, and you have, uh, let's say, another 20% of uh, inaccuracy in each classification of each image. The amount or the kind of the combination of these is the loss. Is for each prediction, how far are you from the truth? So it's, it's a really tricky concept. I would really encourage you to look for someone online that's can, that can explain it a little bit better than I do. But yeah, that's the general idea. How far are you from the, uh, the accurate or the correct uh, uh, estimation? More questions? All right. Uh, yeah, so the question is, do you have any experience with customers regarding these, uh, these deep learning projects? The answer is uh, yes, we kind of integrated uh, some of these uh, techniques or deep learning in general in some research projects that are going on currently. Uh, nothing on, let's say, customer sides, but more of research projects currently. Um, questions? Okay, moving on to the last slide, which is if you want to start your deep learning application, what are the things that you should be looking for? Excuse me. Uh, so what purpose are you trying to do? Are you trying to do natural language processing, or are you trying to do uh, cats versus dogs, for example, or are you trying to do any other voice uh, recognition stuff, so uh, what is your purpose, and that can uh, affect the decisions that you're going to take later. Um, yeah, so that can affect which framework do you want to use, TensorFlow or, Py or PyTorch or Keras or, yeah, which, uh, which framework is better for you, and what language are you more comfortable with? This can also affect the frameworks that you're going to choose. Uh, so a lot of uh, people prefer Python to C, and a lot of academics, let's say, would prefer C, C++ to Python. So this is something you need to consider. Uh, also, can you use existing popular models? So for example, we were able to use all these uh, networks the ResNets, the uh, Inception, the mobile nets. For our purpose, everything works. So maybe you have another purpose. 
you'll have to do a little bit of research. You have to ask around what's the best network to use for this purpose. And the last consideration point, uh, restrictions or requirements uh, for the providers. So we talked a little bit about you cannot have data from the European Union stored outside, so that limits your, cha your, uh, your choices of which cloud providers are you going to uh, use. Um, yeah. Uh, so these are one or four more important points that you uh, need to consider. And after that, you'll be able to decide what am I going to do. I'm, I'm going to use this uh, framework. I'm going to implement this uh, neural network. And I'm going to use it on my machine, for example, or Amazon or uh, paper space. And yeah, that should give you the guide. More questions? Yeah. For your tests, did you, did you actually train the full model or just part of it, as in transfer learning? Yeah, uh, mostly we trained, uh, I think we froze two layers only, and we kind of trained the whole net for, for that. So it's, uh, yeah, that's another technique of uh, deep learning where you, if you have a really big model and you don't want to spend so much time training, you can freeze, let's say, the first 10 layers or so. So you're not training these layers, you're just training the rest. That can significantly reduce the uh, training time. And it might have an effect on accuracy, but it shouldn't be that much. But in our case, we, tr we most likely, or we froze a couple of layers, but we trained the rest. Um, just a note here that uh, tomorrow I'll be also doing a workshop where we will be doing the cats versus dogs. So if anyone is interested, uh, we're going to be doing a workshop on your first deep learning application. And yeah, just run it on your local machine and see how it goes. Uh, back to more questions. Yeah. Uh, so, team of 13 members, how do you do the collaboration between yourselves? Um, so, uh, that's a good question. So, it takes a lot of uh, initiative, a lot of uh, feeling of ownership, let's say, to take tasks and see them through. Uh, uh, I think this question is more about the environment of the work, more than uh, how did we manage to pull through this. Uh, but yeah, uh, initiative be helpful, and uh, usually one guy is not only focused on one project, one small part of a project, you're, uh, you're always trying to look beyond your small scope and actually look on what's everyone doing and try to help be involved in more projects. Uh, more questions? Yeah. Just wondering about um, language processing. How do you enter variable length um, input into a neuronal network? I mean, some people speak like 30 seconds, some like five minutes, and how do you put it in inside as input? Um, yeah, so uh, my experience with natural language processing is not that much, but I've had a colleague before who did a thesis on this, and as long as uh, usually you're working with text and you can configure these parameters or uh, how long do I need a sentence to be, how many characters or how many, uh, yeah, how many words do I need to be in this word. Uh, so if you have more questions, feel free to join me here after the talk. But as we can see, it's time is over. Thank you for, so much for listening.